You're listening to ReachMD XM160, the channel for medical professionals. Welcome to conference coverage highlights from the Radiological Society of North America's 96th Scientific Assembly and Annual Meeting, which took place in Chicago. Your host for this program is Dr. Jason Bernholtz, Director of Diagnostic Ultrasound Consultants in Oak Brook, Illinois. Our guest is Dr. Candace Johnstone, who was very recently Dr. Candace Aiken, who is going to be telling us about her specialty area of radiation oncology. Dr. Johnstone is Assistant Professor of Radiation Oncology at the Medical College of Wisconsin. Well, let's start out this way. Radiation therapy has been around a fairly long time now. I mean, even when I was in medical school, people were doing radiation therapy, and that goes back a ways. And we tend to focus on technical advances in other kinds of imaging and not tend to think of radiation oncology in the same way. And yet you've had some really astounding advances in the last, you know, 30, 40 years. Absolutely. As radiology has become more sophisticated, it has allowed us as radiation oncologists to become more sophisticated as well. Many primary care physicians may or may not know this, but people used to be trained in both diagnostic and therapeutic radiology. We've evolved and separated our training programs, but now as technology advances, there's also some question as to whether imaging should be focused more in our training programs, as we do rely very heavily on imaging. All radiotherapy centers have CT-based simulation facilities, which means that Most patients today get CT scans as part of their radiation therapy planning process. Now, these scans are not diagnostic quality scans. They're not for that purpose. What the purpose of the scans in the simulator are for is to get a patient's anatomy into our system with the different densities of tissues so that the radiation therapy can be adjusted for the difference in the X-ray traveling through fat or air or bone and whatnot, and we can get a very precise picture of the patient's anatomy and the patient's tumor. So all of our work is based on a CT scan. In addition, we have the technology, and in my practice, almost every single lung cancer patient that I treat has a PET scan imported into our planning system, and we can fuse the PET scan with our planning CT. The planning CT is different in that it's in a treatment position, so the patient is treated to accentuate the accessibility of a particular organ for the particular therapy. So, for example, a breast or lung cancer patient has their arms above their head so that we have access to come in with a beam from almost 360 degrees around their torso. So when you fuse a PET scan in with a CAT scan, you then have all the diagnostic power and localization of where the lymph nodes are, where the tumor is, and can do very, very sophisticated radiation plans. Well, let me ask you something else. I mean, you're involved specifically with radiation beams of one kind or another as opposed to pellets or other emitters of radiation. Exactly. I would say the majority of radiation therapy today is external beam radiotherapy, where you use a beam of high-energy X-ray beams to target the cancer and ablate the tumor. It is considered local control, as you said, similar to surgery, but the process of cell kill can happen over days and months. And the therapeutic ratio is the fact that you treat the tumor every day with a small daily dose so that the normal tissues can repair. But since cancer cells have abnormal repair mechanisms, the damage accumulates there and the cells die. Another area of radiotherapy is called brachytherapy and is essentially implanted seeds or pellets. And whether they can be permanent or temporary, for example, a prostate seed implant is a permanent implant with a radioactive element that has a short half-life, typically iodine or palladium. However, in the GYN malignancy realm, you have temporary implants with, say, iridium or cesium And the type of radiation that you choose is based on the kind of cancer, whether it's a permanent implant or a temporary implant. Let's pick an area like a gynecologic tumor disease. Do primary care physicians or gynecologists, let's say, interact with you directly, or do you get your patients as a result of some sort of 
team in the cloud somewhere that says, all right, this is a person for whom radiation therapy is good or chemotherapy is good. Where do you get involved and how do you interact with the patient's primary physician? Where I interact personally with primary care physicians is in the care of patients on treatment or in follow-up. Most of my patients don't come directly from the primary care physician's office to mine unless their primary care provider happens to be an OBGYN who does their pap smear and diagnoses their cervical cancer or whatnot. Most patients see their primary care, may get their pap smear at their primary care, may get their pap smear from their GYN. But then there's obviously a specialization in gynecologists where there's some gynecologists who do primary care gynecology and then GYN oncologists. GYN oncologists are unique from other surgeons in that they do the surgery but also deliver the chemotherapy for gynecologic cancers. So most of the new patients come from the gynecologic oncologist, but then the primary care physician is essential in managing patients on treatment. For example, I do mostly lung and breast cancer as well as pediatric cancers, and many of the lung cancer patients that I treat have multiple comorbid illnesses, and in advanced lung cancer treatment, they get esophagitis, so get dehydrated, can't eat or drink. Often their blood pressure starts to drop, and we manage it with fluids, but then they ask me what to do about all their cardiac medications, and so I would refer them to their primary care physician's office, call their primary care physician's office to have that dialogue between myself and their provider, as well as the patient and their provider, because I don't want to overstep my bounds and take someone off a cardiac medication that their primary care feels that they shouldn't stop and that we should support them in other means, i.e. with fluids or whatnot. Well, it's collaborative, isn't it? Absolutely. Well, we've been speaking with Dr. Candace Johnstone, formerly Dr. Candace Aiken, very recently formerly, and congratulations again. She is from the Medical College of Wisconsin in the Department of Radiation Oncology. Thank you. Next, Dr. Bernholz spoke with Dr. Jacques Souquet, founder and CEO of Supersonic Imaging. I won't go through his bibliography, which would be very, very long, and we'd be here all day uh, with this. But I'll tell you that when I first met Shock, it was 1976, if I recall correctly. He was already a chief engineer, and he was uh, coming to Stanford to do some advanced electrical engineering research in ultrasound, Jacques has been involved with many aspects of medical imaging. I can uh, tell you that at one point he was a uh, chief science officer for Philips, which is one of the major manufacturers of all kinds of imaging equipment. But his main interest, and I think fun interest all along, has been in ultrasound. I think that most of the major advances in the field during the last 30 plus years, either Jacques was involved with it or he caused it. And one of the most advanced areas that we'll come to later that he is absolutely responsible for is called shear wave imaging. And I hope that some year he will be recognized with a Nobel Prize for this, this incredible work. Hi, thank you for joining us. Thank you. With everything that I've said and your <laughs> gray hair and experience, maybe you can tell our audience something about the evolution of ultrasound as you've seen it from the engineering and physics side. Yeah, when just listening to you and remembering the date that we first met in California, lots has changed in the field of imaging and most particularly ultrasound imaging, which is where I've focused most of my work. At the time, uh, the technology was very much, I would say, analog. The digital world had not come to a full-fledged age and was very expensive. But from analog technology, ultrasound devices have evolved towards a digital technology, which brought a little bit more stability in the way the signal could be acquired and processed. This was around the late 70s, early 80s time frame, and this was really a major breakthrough because this paradigm shift provided for new an expansion in the type of processing that could be done to the ultrasound signal and being able to provide new level of information to the customers 
From there, there were lots of work I was involved in. One of them was miniaturization of ultrasound system, but miniaturization without losing the intrinsic performance of the data, which comes out for the physician. And naturally, one of the biggest interests was in the Army, uh, being able to provide on the battlefield an imaging device uh, that could take care of a wounded soldier on the battlefield, as you may know. The statistics from death on the battlefield has not changed since 1870, the Crimean War, and the report of Florence Nightingale, a nurse, that said that the critical time is the first hour of a wounded person. If you don't take care of that person, then the chances of continuing life decreases exponentially. So being able to bring there an imaging device to look and where what the casualties and the type of wound that the soldiers have suffered is essential. And then now we are opening new um, capability where from a pure architectural standpoint, we are capable of leveraging what's been done in other industry, and i am just name one, which is a video game industry, which has been capable of processing data very, very fast and displaying that data as well. So this is exactly the same challenge that we're being faced in ultrasound imaging. So leveraging what's done in that video game industry brings an increased power in the outcome of the diagnostic devices. And now the whole intelligence of the system is no more hardware per se, but it's very much software oriented like what's done in other things in, around the world. Yes, well, I mean, this brings it back to the physician, in a sense, doesn't it? I think of miniaturization and how many times we're seeing now the notion of bringing ultrasound into the emergency room, to the bedside, not just the battlefield, but immediately point of care where the patient is for an immediate triage. And especially if that is done by the physician who is making decisions about the patient, it shortens the time interval significantly. I see this, let us do that. It's entirely correct. This notion of triage before sending the patient to a, a big radiology ward where uh, he or she needs to be observed, I mean, being able to say beforehand, no, it's okay, it doesn't need to go there, we know what to do with such a case, suddenly eases the whole diagnostic process however, certainly puts more constraints on the radiologist of a person who scans to make that call, but that's a training issue, I would say. Yeah, so ultrasound now is not what ultrasound was even just a few years ago. Well, that's the beauty and the excitement to work in ultrasound, that it has been a field of continuous growth, continuous challenges, and discovering new things. If you look at, for example, at 3D, which is something that you know very well, now with the advent of digital processing, there are things that we can do in the 3D or even the 4D world where the fourth dimension is time that uh, wouldn't be possible to exist or to do uh, a few years ago in real-time fashion. And this opens a new door as far as diagnostic outcome, as far as the way a physician looks at, at an image, the way the physician needs to uh, understand what he's seeing. We've been speaking with Dr. Jacques Souquet of Supersonic Imagine from Aison Provence in France. And I thank you very much for sharing your wisdom and knowledge with us. Thank you. If you're just tuning in, you're listening to ReachMD's conference coverage highlights from the Radiological Society of North America's 96th Scientific Assembly and Annual Meeting. Your host for this program is Dr. Jason Bernholtz. Next, Dr. Bernholtz spoke with Dr. Judy Kalanyak, Chief Medical Officer of Naviscan. Hi, thank you for joining us. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for having me. Now, tell me about Naviscan. What do they do? Naviscan is a very small company in San Diego, California, and produces the high-resolution PET device, often called positron emission mammography. It became commercially available in 2007, and it's an alternative for women that cannot get into a breast MR when they need to get some pre-surgical evaluation of their breast once they've been diagnosed with breast cancer. So in a sense, we're talking about PEM scans, that this is something that we're going to do to evaluate something about tumor cells, about how they're functioning, perhaps after you've diagnosed that a tumor is indeed present. 
That's correct. So what a woman would do is she would first have her annual mammogram, and if there's an abnormality noticed, then she would go on to either stereotactic or ultrasound-guided biopsy where they'd do a little tissue sampling. If she gets that unfortunate diagnosis of breast cancer, now we have to define what is the extent of disease so that we can personalize her therapy. And does she have any disease that's occult in the other breast? That happens in about 3 to 6 percent of women. So up to this point in time, the only alternative she had for this further evaluation of the breast was breast MR. But many people can't tolerate breast MR. Breast MR also has a high sensitivity, but a lot of false positives, a low specificity. So what do those women do? So breast PET which is positron emission mammography, is a very high-resolution device that can be utilized to look for additional cancer cells. But instead of using anatomy, we're actually looking at the glucose or the sugar uptake in the cancer cell. Uh, So that the receptor composition of the tumor is not going to influence your results. Like a triple negative tumor, for example, will show up just fine on a PEM scan. It will. All of the cancers do take up sugar, but the triple negatives, the worse your cancer is, the more aggressive your cancer is, the more sugar it tends to eat, the hotter the spot, the easier it is for us to see it on PEM imaging. So we can actually characterize not only do you have additional cancers in your breast, but how aggressive are those cancers. Well, what about trying to decide if a tumor has recurred? Do you have some protocol you'd recommend for, let's say, looking three years or five years or 10 years after a primary has been treated? Absolutely. It is really critical that women follow up with imaging and with clinical examinations because 80% of the recurrence happens within the first three years following the surgery and the definitive therapy. So what mechanisms can you use? You can use mammography. But if your cancer was not seen with a mammogram, one has to question how effective that's going to be. So your other two alternatives is breast MR and PEM has been shown to be really highly effective. We don't have to wait for the cancer to get large and create a lot of blood vessels so that we can see it with a blood perfusion technique as they do in breast MR. We're actually looking at the sugar uptake in the cancer cells. So it doesn't require capillaries, just like, you know, it gets fed by the interstitial fluid, just like all the rest of the cells in your body. So we should see it when it's smaller, easier, and where we can do more targeted and definitive therapy. Now, do you have any idea how small a tumor might be that you would see? Yeah, well, when we do spatial resolution, we can see down to two millimeters, but the smallest tumor we've actually seen and removed has been a one millimeter lesion. So we really can see pretty exquisitely small lesions. A lot depends on how much FDG uptake or the sugar uptake that they have. Is there anything going on in sensors that may make the system much more sensitive in the future, for example? Absolutely. There's lots of research happening in both whole body PET and in the PEM device. We've done studies to clearly show that we can reduce the amount of radio tracer that we're giving so there's less radioactivity to the patient. And we're improving the crystal detectors even more so that we can eventually get into that screening population and or just overall reduce the overall radiation from medical imaging overall to the patient while we're still keeping that exquisitely high sensitivity. Now, PEM devices are fairly small physically, aren't they? They are very small. They're about the size of an ultrasound machine. And our PEM device is on wheels and can be easily pushed around. I've actually tested it in high heels on a slippy floor. One of my first jobs as a medical director. California radiologists are (laughs) are very, very stylish. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, (laughs) Style is everything. When they're not surfing. That's true. That's true. But... If you were in the nuclear field, which I was, and they had the gamma cameras, the old ones that they claimed were portable, and it took four football players to move them around, we wanted to make sure when we said this is portable, it truly is. And in fact, we have some sites that move it from site to site so that they can 
better serve their patients by not having the patients have to drive so far that it can be at one location for a day or two and then they move it to an outer location, more in the rural area, to serve the rural population of women. Oh, so you could put this in a van and just do remote studies. Absolutely. Absolutely. We have a number of sites that are putting it in a van on a daily basis. Good. Well, thank you very much. That was interesting and educational and a great discussion. We've been speaking with Dr. Judy Kalinyak, who is the Chief Medical Officer of Naviscan in San Diego, California. Well, thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Lastly, Dr. Bernholt spoke with Dr. William Denman, Chief Medical Officer of GE Healthcare. I'm told that to his intimates, he's known as Pepper. Pepper, thank you very much for joining us. It's a real pleasure to be here, especially with ReachMD. Um, I think I now know who turns off the lights. That's what I've discovered. But um, <laughs> Of which GE makes also, exactly, right, in one of their divisions. But that, I, I, have, I don't have anything to do with that. <laughs> We're very excited about where we're going right now, particularly for those of you who are here at the RSNA, but in a broader field. If I think back, I've been very fortunate to have done a fair amount of consulting, mostly in a narrow area of ultrasound, over the years, and how, oh, let's say going back 40 years or so, that most advances were kind of academically driven. Some little group has some, a graduate student comes up with a great idea, and that may or may not have been commercialized at some point, typically by a few larger companies who would figure out how to do that notion, concept, or instrument commercially. And then I think there was kind of a phase in which you had some clever engineer who said, ah, this is a great idea, let me form a company to do this specifically. And at this point in time, because research involves typically so many different disciplines to actually come up with a device at the end of the line <laughs> it takes a fairly giant enterprise to do this, that right now a lot of the advances are industry-driven more than the original model, which was of uh, some ivory tower. Oh, I wonder if this will work at some point in the future. And I'm kind of wondering how you kind of get your ideas of what to develop and how you decide this is a good area, let's try to make this possible. For those of you, obviously, who can't see Jason, if he's really been doing this for 40 years, he looks great. The question you raise is incredibly prescient. How do you drive innovation in a complex, matrixed, interlinked environment? If you actually go back and look at some of the data, the Innovation and new ideas do often come from users. There's some great statistics on values of patents and in the medical device world that show a staggering number of them are held by MDs and users who had ideas and worked at the original a priori situation and began to drive the design and the prototyping. I do take your point, though, that says to, to take something frequently from concept all the way to market does require an awful lot of moving parts and interactions. What I'm hearing you saying, though, is where do we get our ideas? And you know what? We don't have a single way of doing it. We have tremendous collaboration with as you talk about the ivory towers, we have lots of situations where we partner with the researchers in the academic medical centers where we iterate and we, we build design and prototype things. Maybe we'll get it to a certain stage and then they will help use it and develop it and give us feedback. We have situations where we um, internally we drive a lot of innovation and development. And then the third leg of that stool is finding small startups which we bring in and see them as good opportunities. I think, though, that what I'd like to say is as we step back from trying to figure out strategically where to go, I think there's a couple of things that the medical industry is embracing and needs to understand from a clinical point of view. One is that regardless of who your customer is, the patient is the final point. And if we focus on the patient and unmet clinical needs, 
particularly in these days of shrinking budgets. That is the pulling force. For us, when you focus on the patient, you actually have a reason for doing it. Iteration and step forward progress is certainly present, particularly in the device world. But we need to make sure that each change is addressing a patient need, an unmet clinical need. And for us, we truly believe that it's so interrelated with managing the cost. A friend of mine who runs a pharmaceutical company once said, if I add five hundred of dollars of cost to care, I need to provide at least five hundred and one dollars of benefit. I stepped back and I thought about that and I realized that we need to make sure that the risk benefit and the cost benefit and the customer value proposition of everything we do is driven by increasing quality, getting more people into the system who didn't have care, and making sure our quality goes up. Let me ask you a question. How easy or hard is it for somebody, let's say you have an ICU nurse who says, oh, I wish I had a device to monitor the following. Or you have somebody who says, you know, I've been caring for patients 12 years and I really think this would be something that would be helpful. How easy or hard is it for them to pass that information on to you so you can get a handle from, you know, this is an area that maybe we should research a little bit more or not. There are just a zillion practical things people do out there all the time that never gets transmitted to other people who are doing it because it may involve a wrinkle, a device, or a way of using a device that's not made public. <laughs> that's a great question. I'm going to show a little bit of my naivete and some of the complete inner workings of the company. I don't know all the pathways of how that would happen at GE specifically. I do know that in my moving around the country and in my, I, I still have a clinical practice one day a week. And I'm frequently, you. <laughs> thank you. I'm frequently approached by colleagues, exactly like you described, talking about, hey, we've got an unmet clinical need, or how could we do this, or could we track this better? I often take those and get them in touch with uh program managers, design engineers, well, and try... Have, you ought to have a blog. Anybody can go put well, their thing in. You know, you know? That's a great <laughs> idea. One of the things, as the bard said, many a slip, twixt <laughs> cup and lip. And who was it that said genius is 10%? Oh, Winston Churchill. And 90% <laughs> perspiration and yeah. 10% inspiration. Winston Churchill. <laughs> and in many ways, I think we all know what I'm talking about. Seeing a vision through is, is hard work. But yes, we do, and that's part of the way we use our research collaborators as that iterative process. But I agree with you. We need to be not just open to our practitioners, what they tell us they need, but I know as a pricing clinician there's certain things that I'm not even sure I need because we've been doing it this way. And one of the things that we we really like to do is have our usability and engineers sometimes even watch workflow, watch the process in a hospital, and begin to help figure out what are the needs and help the clinician work out what they might benefit from. Which, I don't know, when you practice, Jason, I mean, I don't know if you think back on it, were there times when maybe you weren't really sure what you needed, but yet you knew it wasn't the best it could be? Well, yeah, and I always try to reevaluate what I'm doing. It's hard to do to step back and say, am I really doing this the best that I can? And that's what you do in medicine after all, isn't it? You're always trying to improve what you did. So sort of like an athlete who says, that was my time yesterday. What can I do today? It's a lot the same. I bet everybody does that because they... Who doesn't want to improve what they do and think about what they do? We've been speaking with uh, Dr. William Pepper Denman, Chief Medical Officer at uh, GE, and uh, thank you so much for joining us. Jason and the team at ReachMD, it's a real privilege to get a chance to speak with you, and we thank you for your support and the opportunity to be here. Thank you. You've been listening to Conference Coverage Highlights, 
from the Radiological Society of North America's 96th Scientific Assembly and Annual Meeting. ReachMD, online, on demand, and on air. Visit us at ReachMD.com. Thank you for listening.